have you turn to 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter then. 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter. And just before we get into the teaching, I, I neglected to uh, ask Tony if he could also lead us in prayer for the Browns, Cardiff, Wales. This has been uh, uh, an especially tough week for them. Tough in the sense of they've had lots of opportunities with a lot of uh, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses as well as Jehovah's Witnesses coming to them. Um, the Lord has really opened up this door. They've opened up their house and they're having weekly Bible studies and they're they're running the YouTube videos on the Second Coming series. If you know anything about Jehovah's Witness theology, it's mostly eschatology. It's mostly based on, around the Second Coming of Christ. Lots of aberrant thinking in regards to that. And uh, so, so this type of teaching for those who are coming out of the Jehovah's Witness bondage is very important. Um, and many of their hearts are being changed and their eyes are being opened and God's really doing uh, some kind of a work. But there are others who are fighting against that. There are other Jehovah's Witnesses that are maybe thinking about coming out or maybe even just acting like that's what they want, but they're there for other reasons. So we need to hold them up and be especially mindful uh, of, of them uh, this week. So let's just do that quick. Father, we agree together concerning the wonderful work that you're doing in Cardiff, Wales, at David and Lynn Brown's home. And we ask in Jesus' holy name that you would uh, be a real wall of fire about David and Lynn, that no weapon formed against them could possibly prosper. And that every tongue that would rise against them in judgment, you would condemn in the name of Jesus Christ. We ask the Lord God for you to give them wisdom to know what to say, what not to say, how to say it. We ask, Lord God, that you would prosper uh, the word by your spirit through David and Lynn into these men and women, some of, of whom are yours by election and are, are uh, coming into regeneration. Others, Lord, we're not so sure about, and it seems that some might be trying to fight against. So we ask for you to protect them in every way, shape, and form, and encourage and strengthen David and Lynn, and uh, help them, Lord, to be in the Word together, to be feeding together, to make sure that their spirits are built up. We trust, Lord, that you will be doing that for them, and thank Thank you for this work that is going on in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you now to be able to take your people, Lord, into 1 Corinthians 12. Thank you for your anointing and blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 The purpose, permanency, and passing of the spiritual gifts. That's our title today. The permanence, <laughs> permanence, purpose, and passing. That's kind of what? Is that a contradiction? I mean, how can they be permanent and passing? What is that all about? Well, as most of you know, your pastor is a, is a cessationist when it comes to the gifts. But I'm not real consistent about it. And what I mean by that is, is you've heard of a partial preterist before. Well, I am not that but I, I am, I guess, a partial cessationist. <laughs> and most all of you know what I mean by that. I've, I've been that way for, for a long time, since I, I came out of uh, the charismatic Pentecostal realm. Um, just a matter of the Bible says specific things about specific gifts. Um, these gifts in particular, the nine that we have listed here, which we're going to get into today in 1 Corinthians 12 from verses 7 through 11, these nine gifts, five of these gifts, are what I call revelation gifts. Revelation gifts. And, of course, that has to do with, with prophecy, uh, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, tongues, and interpretation of tongues. There's your five right there. I believe those are gone. I believe those are not permanent and they have passed away. And I'm going to give you the reasons that Paul gives for why they would pass away, what their function was, and when they would pass away. Uh, he actually tells us this in the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians, and I'd like to end the teaching today with, with that explanation, if we can, we can do that. Uh, on the other hand, there are four other gifts. Um, the gift of faith, uh, the gifts of healings, note the plural, uh, miracles or powers, and what we call distinguishing of spirits or discerning of spirits. I believe that those are still around. Now, why do I say that? I say that because unlike the revelation gifts where Paul speaks to, though, 
to those revelation gifts and says that they will discontinue. They will katargeo. The power uh, will be deactivated and in the case of tongues, they will just plain stop. And he even says when that would take place. And I'll show that to you. Well, unlike those revelation gifts, there is no passage of scripture that I've ever to find that gives any kind of a, um, uh, a time for that, those gifts to quit, uh, where they would suddenly be katargeo, where they would be deactivated, or that they would pao. Um, we certainly do have explanation in the New Testament as to the purpose of these gifts. And so we'll touch on that, and that, of course, is our first point that's in the text right here. So my purpose today is to try to give clarity in regards to these gifts. We want to know what their purpose was and or is because we want to be able to recognize that. We want to know what is permanent as opposed to what has passed away. That's important. Simply because if, the, if certain gifts are around and the Holy Spirit would choose to give you one of them, and he is the only one that can do that. You, you can ask him for one, but whether you get it or not is something entirely different. So you're going to want to know about those things, and we're going to want to know about what is no longer around because some of our brothers and sisters, we'll just assume that they are at this point, some of our brothers and sisters um, believe that these five revelation gifts are still active. Well, one of the main reasons they believe that is because they're the easiest ones to mimic. They're the easiest ones to, um, to produce, to manufacture. It's easy to speak in tongues. Babble. It's easy to babble. It's easy. It's easy to give an interpretation of the Bible. It's easy to give the so-called word of wisdom or the word of knowledge. It's easy to prophesy. Okay? The, the issue is, and I'll, when we get into it, the issue is, is that these gifts, all of them that Paul talks about right here, are so clearly from God that when they happen and when they used to happen was so obviously a manifestation of God's spirit, nobody was looking at another person going, gee, you think that was from God? I guarantee you it was not that way. And what we see today is, you buy that? On that kind of a level, you know? You think that was from God? And it leaves that question mark kind of, kind of open, all right? So let's, let's dig into the text. Let's remember that as Paul gets us into these gifts, the first three verses here of chapter 12, which I'm, I'm just going to talk about, touch on quickly, and we're just going to move on because I don't want to spend time reteaching passages we've already been on. But remember, he brings up this idea of the spirituals in verse 1. Gifts is in italics. He says the spirituals. He tells him, I don't want you to be ignorant. I don't want you to be about them. The reason behind him saying that is because we've already discovered in this epistle of Corinth that at the Corinthian church, there was a true demonic influence that was active in that church. And it was coming through the idolatry that some of them either used to participate in and or were currently still participating in. In that, he brings it up right here, verse 2. You know that when you were pagans, not in Christ, you were led astray to these mute idols, however you were led. So bring up the fact that there were these idol influences when they were pagans. However, in chapter 8, remember, this idea of idolatry uh, is brought up and he talks about it as it is something that they, some of them were currently dealing with in their lives and that there's a demonic link. Then we went over to chapter 10, right, verses 14 through 22, where Paul talks about the demonic influence that even though there are no true gods gods behind these blocks of wood and stone, these idols, these pictures. There are no true gods, chapter 8. There's only one God. Nevertheless, chapter 10, 14 through 22, that while you are fleeing from these idols, the reason you flee for, from them is because there is a demonic presence behind these idols. These idols give an entree to the demonic spirits that are very much a part of that, Paul is saying. And that's why he... And 
the fact of however, if you are in Christ, you need to understand that you cannot take within you, and he uses the verbs pino, remember this, to drink within you, sit at the table of idols and drink at the table of idols, eat at the table of idols. You cannot take within you a demonic spirit. He makes that very clear. Believers don't have that. They can't have that. Um, they're not subject unto that because they're regenerate, because the Adamic sin nature has been removed, because the Holy Spirit resides within. Christ in me, by the Holy Spirit, is the expectation of glory. Greater is he that is in me than what you finish it. That's right. That's 1 John 4.4. 4. So this is not going to happen. Rather, they are scared of you and want very little, if anything at all, to do with you. And only the crazy ones come after me. <laughs> They're all crazy. So we went through all of that. And when he brings up this idea of idols and there would be a demonic spirit behind those idols, that's what gets us into the situation in verse 3 right here of chapter 12. Therefore I make known to you, no one speaking by the Spirit of God says, Anathema Isu. Jesus is accursed. Nobody speaking. By, and to us, it's like, well, isn't that obvious? Nobody, the Holy Spirit speaking through somebody is not going to curse Jesus. Because you have to understand, this is where they were as a people group and a, and a maturation level. They were asking, actually asking Paul, could this be the Spirit of God saying that? Because evidently somebody publicly in their meeting was cursing Jesus. Now, only a demonic spirit or some. It's just crazy or out of control. But probably the demonic here, because of the background that he's already given us, is going on and is active there at Corinth saying these things. It is very sad, very, very disgusting. So in the background behind all of this, he would then say, and at the same time, bottom of three, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Spirit. And that's where I've said to you before, anybody can say the words Jesus is Lord, right? Anybody can say those words. But only by the Holy Spirit can you say it how? Salvifically, right? Only by the Holy Spirit can you say it in a salvation manner and make that confession that Jesus is Lord. And then the importance, verses 4 through 6, we went through in regards to the members and involvement of the Godhead with the spiritual gifts. We see in verse 4 that there are a variety of gifts, charisma, but the same spirit. Holy Spirit. Five, varieties, different kinds of ministries, because these gifts have to do with ministries, but the same Lord Jesus Christ. Verse six, varieties of effects, workings, energies, but it's the same God, the Father, who works all things in all. And that's as far as we have, we have gotten. Um, it's absolutely important to remember that we do need God's gifts. Of course we need God's gifts. Some remain, some are, are no longer around. In Ephesians 4, uh, it gives us, starting at verse 11, it gives us the listings. It's five names, but it's actually four altogether. Um, what's known as ministry gifts. You have apostles, which are still around. Apostles are right here. They're in the Word. So the apostle, apostolic ministry is right here. Then we have prophets. We'll talk about them. Then we have evangelists still around. Do the work of an evangelist. All of, all of you are evangelists. Um, then we have pastor and teachers. And the Greek construct right there is known as the Granville Sharps rule of Greek grammar. And it's set up in such a way that makes us understand that pastor and teacher are the same office. If, if you're a pastor, you're a teacher. If, you know, that, that shepherding aspect is done through the teaching ministry. But we've also got seven more gifts that are listed in Romans 12. Verses 6 through 8. Romans 12, verses 6 through 8. Prophecy happens to be one of them, so that crosses over with this. But then there's some gifts that are, that are in Romans 12, 6 through 8 that are not here in 1 Corinthians, the ninth chapter. Obviously, this is not about comparing those passages, or I'd have, you, I'd have you turn. I'm just interested in getting us through this section in 1 Corinthians. Lastly, there, is a, there are two gifts named, two more gifts named in 1 Peter 4, verses 10 and 11. 1 Peter 4, verses 10 and 11, that's prophecy again, but it's also 
service, acts of service. And Peter speaks about it in a general way. So we need to know what gifts are available, what are the ones that are not available, and to know why some are no longer available. And like I say, um, when a gift is obviously a manifestation of the Spirit, there is no question about it. My position is that God gives wisdom and insight and leading to us. First and foremost, he does it through the word. Secondly, he does it as you are actively reading the word. Secondly, he does it as you are actively hearing the word, like right now. That's why I got to be being very careful here that I stick with what the scripture says. It also happens as the Holy Spirit brings back your mind. 2 Timothy 2.7 talks about that, that the Holy Spirit brings back to your mind as you are considering the things that the Word has to say. And he'll, and he'll remind you. He'll drop passages on you and things like that. I sometimes I say, maybe lift it out of your spirit after you've put it into your spirit. Certainly he does those things. Um, that's what I believe. Uh, the primary purpose of the gifts that we have to remember is always, always to glorify and verify Jesus is the Messiah, is the Savior of the world, has been sent to us by God. That's originally what they were for. Okay, having said all that, let's first talk about the purpose of the gifts. And you'll notice that as we read through the text real quick, that not all the gifts are, in, are categorized here. I am attempting to categorize them for you, so hopefully it will be a little easier to understand. But as Paul gives them, he, he, he kind of mixes them up just a little bit in the sense that, that they're not all in the revelation gift category, or they're not all in the service category, and that kind of a thing. So let's read the text from 7 through 11. Paul says, but... To each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. To another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. Now that's not saving faith. That's a different kind of faith. We'll talk about that. To another the gifts of healings by the one spirit to another the effecting of miracles to another prophecy and to another the distinguishing of spirits to another various kinds of tongues to another the interpretation of tongues but one and the same spirit works all things distributing to each one individually just as he wills now, if you notice on your outline, as we start the first point, which is the purpose of the gifts. What is the purpose of the gifts? We're going to deal with verse 7 and 11 in that order. 7 and 11. And then we'll come back and catch 9 and 10 and 8 and, and 10b and, and that kind of a thing. Because that's the way these gifts are laid out. So what is the purpose of the gifts? Well, Paul says in verse 7 that to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So you see that right away. But just before we get to the common good, Paul wants everybody to know that everybody in the church, local congregation, gets a gift. Everybody gets a gift. Now what it says at the top of verse 7? To each one is given. You know who each one is? Yeah, Pat's got it right. Pat's doing the sign language thing. He's going, me and all of you. That's exactly correct. You are the each one. Do you know what you're Yeah. Good. You have a gift. This is the only place it says this. In uh, 1 Peter 4 and verse 10. 1 Peter 4, verse 10, Peter says, As each one has received a gift, employ it in serving one another as stewards. Everybody gets a gift. The Holy Spirit makes sure that everybody is covered. Each believer is integrally involved in ministering to somebody else in the body and has to be ready and available and with the proper tools, tools or gifts in order to do that. See, each one, and that's, that's decided by the Holy Spirit. But notice what, it, what he calls it. What, is, what does he call it here? To each one is given the what? 
manifestation of the Spirit. The phanerosis, that's the Greek word, phanerosis uh, of the Spirit. Manifestation of the Spirit. Uh, manifestation is perfectly good. Phanerosis just means to make something known. Phanerosis, manifest. Now it's the manifestation of the Spirit. Now when we think about that word manifest, it means something that is declared. If you, if you are on a, a boat or a plane or something like that, there's usually a ship's manifest. And it, it could be a manifest of passengers. It will declare who it is exactly that's on the ship or on the boat. It could be a manifest of what's in the cargo hold, you know, or packages, like that. It's a manifest. It makes it known. Now, what is great about this is what gift you, whatever gift that you have is going to be a manifestation of the Spirit. That means that it's going to come out of you and be seen and known by other people. And this is something that you cannot suppress. Let me say that again. When the Spirit manifests Himself through you in a gift, it cannot be suppressed. This is why I say to you, I say to you unequivocally, that when these gifts manifest, and when those five revelation gifts used to manifest, it was clearly, absolutely, without question, the Holy Spirit moving. There was no question about it. There was no looking twice at each other, there was no raising of the eyebrows, you know, nothing like that, nothing like that. You remember when the children of Israel, of course, come out of Egyptian bondage, and Moses leads them to the foot of Mount Sinai, and, and you know, God's going to speak to them, and it's, it's, there's lightning, and there's crashing, and it's incredible firework display of divi the divine presence and glory that's on the mountain, and there's blackness and darkness and this kind of thing, and then God begins to speak, and the people lose their minds, and they run, right? And they say to Moses, listen, you go talk to him. You tell us what he says. We don't need to know. You know, we don't want to hear this, right? Clearly a manifestation. There's no question about it. Listen to me. The gifts are on that same level. They come self-authenticating. They come self-attesting. This stuff that goes on in the charismatic and Pentecostal realm, of which I was involved for a lot of years, as you all know, because I keep telling you, uh, this kind of stuff, it's like, no, no, my friends. No, 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 no. This is all flesh that's going on. Maybe something demonic, but a flesh that's going on. It's just people doing this stuff. That's why, that's why the most popular gifts are anything that's easily manufactured, vocally and orally. They're easy to do, but it's pretty tough pulling off a miracle, is it not? It's pretty tough healing cancer. Can I get an amen? <laughs> it's pretty tough. And I could go on, okay? This is the manifestation of the Spirit. And what's the purpose? Well, it's, it's for what? Bottom of seven. The common good. Good, 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 good. In other words, it's for everybody else. So gifts, when they are manifested, the purpose is it is for everybody else. Uh, um, if you look at chapter 14 real quick and look at verse 3, notice how this theme continues to carry on. Then chapter 14, he's dealing mostly with tongues and interpretation of tongues, a little bit of prophecy and their abuse of it. Uh, but in verse 3, he says, but one who prophesies speaks to men. See that everybody else thing? For edification, their edification, their exhortation, their consolation. See, that's who that's for. Verse 4, one who speaks in a tongue edifies himself because it's selfish. It's selfish. And we'll talk about the difference between the singular tongue and the plural tongues. But one who prophesies does what? Yeah, builds up the church. So it's for the common good. So prophecy right on. Uh, bottom of verse 5. Uh, greater is one who prophesies than one who speaks in a tongue. tongues unless he interprets so that the church may receive edifying. Verse 6. What will I profit you unless I speak to you either by way of revelation, knowledge, prophecy, or teaching? So it has to profit you, it says, profit you. Verse 12, so also since you are jealous of the spirituals, seek to abound for the edification of the church. It's for the common good, yes? Verse 19, 
However, in the church, I desire to speak five words to my mind that I might instruct others also, rather than speaking 10,000 words in a tongue, singular, babble. 26. What is the outcome then, brother, and what's this supposed to be? When you assemble, each one has a teaching. This is negative, by the way. A lot of people think that this is positive, like he's saying that this is what it's supposed to be like. No, he's saying this is what it's like when you guys come together. Each one has a psalm. Each one has a teaching. No, there are designated officers that are to have the teaching and are to bring the psalm. Each one has a revelation, has a tongue, note the singular, an interpretation. But let all things be done for edification. Well, it's not edifying if, if, if some say a teaching that is out of order from their position in the church. Those who are not teachers and or teachers and or elders slash pastors are not to be bringing teaching. We'll get into that as we as we go through this. And it's all locked into to scripture right here. So you look back then and you see, all right, I'm getting it now. Verse 7 of chapter 12. The manifestation of the Spirit is for everybody else's benefit. Look at verse 11. Look at verse 11. Chapter 12, verse 11. But one and the same Spirit works all things, all these things, distributing to each one individually just as he wills. Okay. So there is a purpose. The purpose of the gifts is not for me. The gift that is given to me is not for me to enjoy and make me feel extra super crispy spiritual or something like that. It's for the benefit of everybody else. And because it's for the benefit of everybody else, I have to understand that it is someone else, someone very important behind all of this that is distributing these gifts as he wills. Well, verse 11 tells us it's the spirit that does this. So this is according to his will. Hebrews 2.4 says something very similar, by the way, that the Holy Spirit is involved with distributions of the gifts according to his will. That's why I say to you, I, I used to come across this in the Pentecostal charismatic realm. It was like people be like asking God's spirit, you know, <laughs> praying, asking God's spirit for a certain gift, you know, kind of a thing. Or, or, or trusting God or stepping out in what they called stepping out in faith to see something manifest, some gift manifest in their life, like prophecy or the gifts of healings or something like that. You don't do that. You don't do that. You're a fool to do that. You're out of order. You're in sin. You're, you're, you're being presumptuous and trying to steal something that doesn't belong to you. See, even if it's something that is still around and has not been deactivated or stopped by God's Spirit. So this is the purpose of the gifts. It's for everybody else, and it's, it's, it's according to the will of the Holy Spirit that these things are distributed. Very important. So that brings us to the second point now. Second point now. The second point, by the way, if we could hold down all the movement, I'd appreciate it. If we could hold, get our kids to kind of stay still, that would be, that would be great. I'd appreciate that a lot. All right, second point, second point. This is the purpose. Then, secondly, what about the gifts that are permanent, the permanent gifts? Now we're going to deal with verse 9 and the first part, part of verse 10. Verses 9 and the first part of verse 10. This will be, of course, the gift of faith, the gifts of healings, miracles, and distinguishing of spirits. And I'm going to give you some examples of how these works, uh, these work according to Scripture as best I can. Okay, I'm just going to say the words and just, you know, leave it there like that. All right, so let's move into these permanent gifts. Starting with verse 9, he says to one another or to another individual, and we know that that's to each one is given, verse 7, right? To each one is given, so to another, uh, the Holy Spirit will give, verse 9, faith, it says. To another, faith. Now, this is not faith for salvation. I said that earlier. This is not faith for salvation. Uh, this is something entirely... Because he's talking about a gift that's given to people who already have exercised faith unto salvation. So it's not about that. This is not uh, the kind of faith that all believers are to possess and are to grow. With me on that? This is something I will call special faith. This is a, a 
faith that is for something outstanding to be done. Something extraordinary, which if we break that word down means extraordinary, okay? To believe God for something. This is not something you can just sort of decide to have. Like, okay, this is a real challenge. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask God for special faith. You know, no, no, no. Remember, the gift is, uh, these gifts are, are for who? Everybody else, right? It's not for you. It's not for you to help you believe more or believe better. No, 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 no. This is something entirely different. For instance, remember in Luke 17 where the apostles come to Jesus and they say, Lord, increase our what? Faith, okay? Increase our faith. And Jesus says, oh, man, if you had faith, you know, like a little mustard seed, you'd say to this mulberry tree, be lifted up and planted in the sea. You know, we've talked about this before. Mulberry trees, intricate root systems, you're very tough to pull out of the ground. Farmers hated to come across those and have to clear those out of their field. I mean, get the, get the oxen and hook this thing up. It was a job, you know, kind of a thing. All right? But he's saying, he's saying, you want faith? This is not the gift of faith. Then he says to them, use the faith that you have, and that's how it grows in strength. That's Jesus' message in Luke, the 17th chapter. Remember, every time somebody would come to Jesus asking him for something, but specifically healing, healing in their body, Jesus would always challenge them by demanding what? Faith. Faith, every time. There is not a time when somebody came up to Jesus asking for healing that he did not require faith or make an allusion to that in one way or the other. That is not what this is. This is not Christ's gift of faith that he gives to his elect so that they might be saved. The gift of faith. The faith that is of Christ. Galatians 2.20, for instance. Or Galatians 3.16, or something along those lines. Now, this is not uh, faith of Romans 10.17. Faith comes by hearing the words of God. No, 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 no. This is extraordinary and special. Okay, what, what, what in the world do I mean by that? Uh, Acts 19 and verse 11 gives a pretty good example, I think, of special faith. Acts 19 and verse 11. Paul's at Ephesus, and it says, Acts 19.11, that God was performing extraordinary, or special, miracles, dunamai, powers, powers. God was performing extraordinary powers by the hands of Paul. What were they? So that handkerchiefs or aprons were even carried from his body to the sick and diseases left them and evil spirits went out. Okay, that was, that, I believe that that was special faith working. Paul couldn't get to where uh, he needed to be to minister to these people. People probably writing to him, talking to him about this. You know, he can only be at one place at one time. The aprons and the, and the handkerchiefs he's talking about are basically sweat rags that, you know, leather artisan that he was, he'd have maybe, you know, we see it, we'd stick it in our back of our jeans, our jeans pocket to be hanging out. Well, you know, what he would be like wearing it around his neck, maybe tied like a little bandana deal around his head. And, you know, he'd take this and he'd start, take his knife and he'd cut off pieces like this, maybe put his hands on it and ask God and have special faith. He had the gift of special faith that when people touch this, and that, that cancer would go, that demon would go flying out. These are extraordinary special faith deals. It doesn't say that they wouldn't be repeated, but they're extraordinary. They're not daily. They're not normal. It's very, you would see these very little. And I think special faith is along, is along those lines. Also, if you look back at 1 Corinthians 13, and you look back at verse 2, 1 Corinthians 13, 2, where, of course, the subject here is, is talking about the primacy of love. Even if you spoke in tongues of men and angels, you had this great gift, but you didn't have love, you're just a, a noise. Verse 2, if I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, pasan ten pistain, all the faith is what that is literally. If I had all the faith, special faith, 
And then he describes what that faith will do. So as to remove what? Hmm, mountains. That's right. So that it would remove mountains, but if I don't have love, I'm nothing. Okay, special faith is going on right here. Do I think it's still around? There's nothing in the scripture that says the gift of special faith would terminate. I ain't got it. I, I have no problem with that. It's important. You see, if God says something is, that is. If God says something was and is no more, and here's why, then it's not. <laughs> I don't know what else to say to you, you know? It's the primacy of Scripture leading us, not experience. So the gift of faith. Verse 9, the gift to another faith. We're in 12.9 now. By the same Spirit, he says. Gift of faith. To another, the gifts of healings by one Spirit. So we're into the next one now. The gifts of healings by the one Spirit. Now, uh, Gifts, uh, plural form in the Greek text, healing, eomai, in the plural as well. English translations don't bring it out that way just because of stylistic concerns. And sometimes I wish they would take their stylistic editors and just fire them. You know, just translate the thing. Oh my gosh, if people aren't going to learn how to read Greek and Hebrew, then translate the thing like it says. You know, so it sounds clunky. So what? It's the truth of what needs to be communicated. Oh, okay. The gifts of healings by the Spirit. All right, what's the gift of healings? Simple. This is easy. This is a 100% performance rate on the per person that has the gifts of healings. That means whatever physical malady they speak to, they lay their hands on, they have that gift and that thing has to go. If, it, if somebody claims to have the gifts of healings, and why is it plural? Because so many different kinds of diseases, there are healings for each of the diseases. They all match. If there's a disease or a sickness, think about this. God's got the healing for that. Isn't that something? God's got the healing for that. That's fantastic. Once again, do I think this is still around? There's no text that says it would be or has been removed. That's how I view it, ladies and gentlemen. At the same time, I don't believe I've ever seen this tested. Maybe you have. I'm not going to say people haven't, but I'm going to test it, especially when people think that they have this gift. I'm going to test it because it requires a 100% batting average. You got to be you got to be right every time. Same thing is true about prophecy. We'll get to that when we can. I I don't think I'm going to get through these today. This might be a part two situation set up right here. All right. So gift of healings. I mean, I, what else do I need to say about that? I mean, the gift of healings. You know, Acts two twenty two. In Acts two twenty two, it says that Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus the Nazar, the branch, Jesus of Nazareth uh, was manifested to the people of Israel and was attested to, to being the Messiah, through miracles, signs, and wonders which he had performed. He had it all going on. And you know, crazy stuff. Jesus, I mean, guy, people who were lame or, or were... Um, uh, people who are lamed or maimed, they were missing an arm. When Jesus was done, boink, that arm was sticking out. Jesus goes into the, into the synagogue, man with the withered hand. I mean, the hand just had, you know what withering was back then? He got into some kind of accident or maybe it was a disease. I don't know, but it looked nothing like his other hand. It was completely unusable. When Jesus said, stretch forth your hand, he didn't just go, the withered hand, stretching it forth, he had to grab it and pull it up. There was nothing going on with this hand. No control, just withered, probably black skin. Talk about horrible death, terrible. And of course, this is going to kill him. You know, because it's going to keep moving throughout his system. So Jesus actually saves the guy's life by healing his arm. This is not a guy that just saying, well, this is a drag, having this appendage just kind of hanging there and I can't really do anything. Oh, no, 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 no. He had a death sentence on him. So Jesus turns around, he's just in anger, the text says. You know, you know, is it lawful to save a life or to kill it, right? Stretch forth your hand. Well, you know, as soon as he stretched it forth, grabbing it, he probably on the way up started feeling, wait a minute, I can move this. I can move this thing. You know, and I mean, it was completely done just like that. Jesus had a 100%.
So, so when I say to people, I, I, I can believe that this is around, but you got to be consistent. There is no room for error with these gifts. Why do I say that? Because I'm a jerk about it? No, because it says that it's a manifestation of who? The Holy Spirit. So I want to see the Holy Spirit. My God heals perfectly and absolutely. My God, when he heals, my God, when he provides, my God, when he speaks, is clear, crystalline, pure, provides exactly what you need, exceeding abundantly above all we could ask or imagine. When God does it, that's my God. That's your God. Expect nothing less. But don't let somebody sell you when say, they say, I got something, and it doesn't follow into the, fall into the biblical criteria of performance and results. The gift of healings. Let's move on to another one. I'm going to take you down to verse 10. Take you down to verse 10 now, first part. To another, the effecting of miracles or the working of of miracles. Uh, miracles is, is a plural for dunamis, so it means powers. Um, I don't know, folks. This makes it kind of nebulous, quite frankly. You know, powers, miracles. We translate the word powers into miracles. Um, miracles could be a lot of different things, couldn't it? Um, I don't know what to say very much about this, other than when it presents itself, it's obviously a power that is beyond human ability. It's a power that manifests that is beyond human ability. Humans can't do this. It's a power. It could, I mean, when you stop to think about it, uh, healing is, is a miracle. That's easy to, to, that's easy to receive in your ears, isn't it? A key ling is a miracle, but, but it's a power. It's an incredible power from God. You know, healing the maimed, Jesus said. I mean, that's a power from God. It's a miracle. We're a little too loose with that word sometimes, I think. Um, the working of miracles. Matthew 17, 27. Let me take a quick look at that. Matthew 17 and verse 27. Um, this is the situation where in verse 24 of Matthew 17, uh, the individuals from the temple who collect the double drachma tax, uh, uh, that's actually for the upkeep of the temple, and they, they went to the Jewish uh, males and the Jewish families once a year and collected this, this tax. Nice. Anyway, uh, they come up to, uh, to, uh, to Peter and they ask if his master, Jesus, pays the double drachma. You know, and Peter says, well, yeah, he does. And Jesus, or then Peter then goes up to Jesus and, you know, is, it, Jesus is in uh, striking range of Peter right now. And he says, uh, what were they asking you? <laughs> what are they, you know, what do you think, Simon? Um, from whom do the kings of the earth collect customs or poll tax? From their sons or from strangers? Peter says, from strangers. Jesus said, then the sons are exempt. We're exempt from their taxes. However, so that we do not offend them, verse 27 says, go to the sea, throw in a hook, take the first fish that comes up. I just did this the other day. <laughs> yeah, I got a tax bill coming. I already know what, they're gonna, what they want from me. It's the same thing they want from me every year. Right? And I'm dependent upon God to, to provide it. <laughs> yeah, here we go. It's, it's, yeah, it's the hook. Okay, so go into this, throw in the hook, take the first fish that comes up. When you open its mouth, you'll find $2,000 in there, Kelly. You'll find a shekel. Take that and give it to them for you and for me. Okay, okay. And Jesus wasn't walking around with a wallet or a money bag full of jingly jinglies or anything like that. So this is a power. This is a miracle, you know, simple, simple enough. Uh, do, do I think this goes on? The text does not say that it's not going to be around. And so it is, but we test it, right? 1 Thessalonians 5, test all things, hold fast to that which is good. Context right there is talking about prophecy, so we do want to be uh, careful with that. All right, bottom of verse 10 now, or actually middle, excuse me, middle of verse 10, after he says prophecy, we'll come back to that, and to another, the distinguishing or discerning of spirits. Diakrisi pneumaton is how it reads in the Greek. Diakrisi pneumaton. Dia means to, krise comes from krima, which means to judge. To discern or dis to distinguish is to judge between two things. 
Okay, it's simple. But it's of the spirits, distinguishing of spirits, not the Holy Spirit, but spirits. Okay, the, dis the distinguishing or the discerning of spirits is this. Uh, you would need that gift to determine if the situation, the person that you're dealing with, the circumstance that you're dealing with, is it coming from God's spirit? That's number one. And we, we have the... We can have the Bible for that, of course, but sometimes it's, it's of a, such a subjective nature, you need God's Spirit to give this gift for the good of everybody else so that everybody else can know, is this thing that is being proposed, this thing that we're hearing, this thing that we're seeing, is it God's Spirit? Or, secondly, is it, is it flesh? Is it man's spirit? Is it just men that are saying, doing this, whatever the situation you know might be? That we're this. Or, third, is it what? Is it a demonic spirit? So, God's spirit, man's spirit, demonic spirit. I think this gift is still around, and I have to tell you, I think I've exercised it. I don't mean exorcised it. It's, God, get it out of me. I, I, I think that God has given... And by the way, that brings up something. I, I don't find anywhere that it says that when God gives a gift, it's permanent and stays with you for life. I think that's an assumption that we have. I think it's more likely, according to Scripture, that these things can move around by the Holy Spirit. In other words... You, I, I don't think it's right that, you know, a, a saint of God who exercised some of these gifts would maybe die and then on his gravestone it would say so-and-so and they had the gift of tongues and they had the gift of prophecy and they, you know, discerning of spirits, you know, kind of, and I don't think it's permanent like that. I think it kind of moves around. And now, I'm not saying that's absolutely so, but I'm suspicious of that based upon what I have seen uh, at certain times. But, but God has, I believe, certainly um, used that, that, uh, that gift. And then other times, it's, it's not there. You know? So, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, these are, these are subjective things in their use. They are subjective in regards to their use. So, these are the permanent gifts. I'm trying not to spend a ton of time. Let me give you a quick example. Uh, in Acts 16, verses 16 through 18, I think we've got an example of discerning of spirits. Acts 16, uh, verses 16 uh, through 18. That's where uh, Paul is in uh, Philippi, I believe. And uh, there is a woman who... Uh, has a spirit of python. That just means she's, she's a reader, you know. But she's actually demonized, the text says. She's actually got a demon that's enabling her uh, to, uh, to read fortunes and, and, and tell accurately people about their lives and what's going on. And, and, and she's actually a slave girl, and she's making a lot of money for her masters. They're using her, they're charging, and she seems to be pretty accurate. And the reason is, is because she's got this demon who happens to know things, you see. And, so, and of course, here's this woman. She's following Paul down and saying, these men are servants of the Most High God. They show you a way of salvation. And she does this for like three days. Paul gets tired of it, and he turns to her, and he commands the demonic spirit to get out. Of course, he gets out immediately at that moment. And oh, by the way, and oh, by the way, according to Jesus in Mark chapter 9 and in Luke chapter 9, the casting out of demons is a miracle, Jesus says. The, remember the story right there where there is the man that, that, uh, that John and James find and he doesn't follow. He's not one of the 12. He doesn't follow them. And he's casting out demons and he's actually doing it and he's doing it in Jesus' name. He's a, some kind of believer. We don't have his name. But he's a brother. He's in Christ and he's doing this stuff by faith. And they, say, they try to stop him. They tell Jesus about it. Jesus don't be doing that. Don't be stop, stopping them because no one will be able to do a miracle in my name and afterwards speak lightly about me. So casting out of demons is a miracle. And yet we see it as a common thing that Jesus gives to a lot of different people, like to the 70, for instance, before he sends them out. We have this guy, unknown, and he's doing it. Paul the apostle, he's doing it. 
You know, it, it's, it's not a stretch, I don't think, to, to see other people um, who are not within this category, you know, of apostleship, but they believe Christ, and they're, when they're confronted with this thing, they cast it out, because the power is not in them. It's not a gift of the Spirit. The power for casting out is not in you. It's not a gift of the Spirit. The power is in the authority of Jesus' name and the knowledge of what he has done on the cross and how he has kicked in the slats, not only Satan, and of course now he's in the lake of fire, but all of the demonic and all the principalities have been dealt with through the cross. We just saw that recently in Colossians 2. So it's, it's a miracle, but it's not in these categories right here, and it certainly is for the benefit of somebody else. So, you know, we can say that. Discerning of spirits. So there's an example in regards to that. These are the permanent gifts, gift of faith, gifts of healing, Miracles and discerning of spirits. I, 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 the reason I say they're permanent, once again, is because I can find no scripture that says they have gone anywhere or that they will go anywhere. I don't buy into the... Um, it would be real easy for me to just say um, that I am a cessation... I believe that all of them, these gifts, these manifestations of the spirit, are gone. I can't do that and be biblically upright before you. And I that's right. I don't think I can just, you know, categorically just say they're all gone unless you can support it by Scripture. And by the way, if, if the Scripture doesn't allow for them to go away, we have to believe that they're still here because there's no instruction that says that. In which case, why would you not want them? If God de deems that they should still be here, then good. Let the Holy Spirit give to whom he wills and let the true manifestation of the Spirit take place. But let it be the manifestation of the Spirit. We are not told to go around asking for these things. It's okay to desire them. You're going to see that in chapter 14, verse 1, where he, Paul encourages people to desire to prophesy. That's fine. That's okay. But let's make sure that when they do manifest that they are, in fact, the manifestation of the Spirit. And, and really, if it's a true manifestation of the Spirit, it will be self-attesting. It will be self-attesting. It doesn't have to go through this thing. You know why Paul had to say to the Thessalonians about prophecy and test all things and you know, make sure that they're good? is because there were fakers out there. There were phonies. And we're going to see some of them uh, in the 14th chapter. So there's the permanent gifts. Now, uh, let's see how we can do with this. Let's talk about the gifts that are passing. The gifts that are passing. Now we're back to verse 8. We're going to do verse 8 and the second half of, of verse 10. So starting at verse 8, what are the gifts that have passed? Verse 8, he says to them in the first century before they had passed, for to one is given the word of wisdom. Word of wisdom. Uh, the word of wisdom, best way I can define this is this is insight into the true nature of things. Insight into the true nature of things. Now I'll come back to that. Let's keep going. For one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. I just think these words are not, these are so important right here. One is given through the Spirit. That means that he makes himself known as being the giver. So there's no question on the part of the one that now possesses, in this case, the word of wisdom. That's not something that they had before. Suddenly they have this insight into the true nature of things, and they speak that out. I'm going to give you an example in just a minute. Keep going. Middle of verse 8. And to another, the word of knowledge according to the same spirit. Now I'm emphasizing according to the same spirit. Through the Spirit to one is given. The Spirit, the Spirit, the Spirit. Okay, So it's not something flesh. It's not something you can decide on your own. It's, it's not even something you can ask for. It's something that we've already learned according to verse 11. He distributes according to his will. So it's the Spirit that's in charge of this. I say let him be in charge of this. All right, word of wisdom, word of knowledge. Uh, look at Acts 5 with me. Acts 5. 
and the first five verses. You're familiar with this. Here's the situation with Ananias and Sapphira selling a piece of land, because everybody else that had land was doing it, and bringing the proceeds, the money from the sale of the land, putting it before the feet of the apostles. It's all very public, right? Um, and then the money, of course, was divided up and used for others uh, right away. This is how the church take, took care of itself. This is before entitlements and BS like that. Whoops, I guess I shouldn't have said BS. All right. But a man named Ananias, Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property and kept back some of the price for himself. Now, that's a fact, right? See, a word of knowledge is, is, is knowledge that is known by only certain individuals. It's information that is known but is not known publicly. It might be a secret, for instance, or in this case, an agreement between Ananias and Sapphira that they're going to sell some land, they're going to keep the money, right? Do you understand what they did, right? They sold the land, let's say they got you know, 50 drachmas or, or something like that. Well, that would be pretty cheap. And uh, they're keeping 25, but they're giving 25, and they're just going to say that they sold the land for 25 so they can get the accolades. That's what's going on right here, okay? All right, so they sell this piece of property. Verse 2, they kept back some of the price for himself with his wife's full knowledge, and bringing a portion of it, he laid it at the apostles' feet. Okay, those are the facts, right? But Peter said, Ananias, watch this, why has Satan filled your heart? Stop. That's discernment of spirits. See it? Why has Satan, you did this pressed by Satan. Okay? Discernment of spirits. Dis, uh, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? That's a word of wisdom. That's insight into the true nature of things. To lie to the Holy Spirit. That's really what's going on here, Ananias. You've lied to the Holy Spirit. You haven't lied to us. You've lied to the Holy Spirit. And to keep, here we go, and to keep back some of the price of the land. That's a word of knowledge. Yeah, because it's facts that are known, but was only known by Ananias and Sapphira. You see that? Facts that were known to them. So you got three gifts working right thing. Bing, 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 by Peter. All in, in, a, in a sentence. It's all in a sentence. And three of them are manifested just like that. You see what I'm saying? You see, and, and what do you think Ananias' response to that was? It, he's going to drop dead over it. He's going to be so blown away by the manifestation of the Spirit. See, it's obviously the Spirit. This is my point, okay? And he, it's going to kill him. It doesn't say God kills him. It doesn't say that. Let's keep reading. While it remained unsold, did it remain your own? After it was sold, was it not your control? Was it that? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? Word of wisdom. For you have not lied to men, but to God. And as he heard these words, it's the words that killed him. Ananias fell down, breathed his last. The Greek uh, says, uh, exuke. Uh, his soul went out. <laughs> as he heard these words, there was no life left in him. It took his soul right out of his body. Powerful, powerful, powerful. The manifestation of the Spirit can kill sometimes. Oh. Oh. I guess we should be extra careful about this. Doesn't mean you, you fear it, but you don't play with it or take it for granted. And as he heard these words, Ananias fell down, breathed his last, and great fear came over all who heard it. Well, I would hope to shout. There's a great example, a word of wisdom, word of knowledge, and discerning of spirits working right there. All right, keep going now. Word of wisdom through the spirit, verse 8, word of knowledge according to the same spirit. This is knowledge that is known, information that is known. Wisdom is the insight into the true nature of things. Okay, with me? All right, so word of wisdom, word of knowledge. Now, let's, let's slip down here to prophecy. Now we're in verse 10. Verse 10 again. To another, the effecting of miracles, and then it's right after that. To another, prophecy. All right, prophecy 
Um, there's, there's two kinds of prophecy in the Bible. There is foretelling prophecy and there is forthtelling prophecy. To tell before is predictive prophecy. To tell before, foretell, before a thing happens. It's predictive. Then there is forthtelling. That's to declare something. Forthtelling prophecy is preaching. To declare a thing. That's, it's prophesying. What you hear me do every Sunday and on Wednesdays, and if you're here on Tuesdays, that's prophesying. I am forth telling what the Word of God has to say. So there's a difference between the two. One good example of foretelling prophecy, to prophesy before in the New Testament, is by a, a fellow named Agabus, who was a true prophet. He was a true foreteller of certain events. That's found in Acts 11.28. Acts 11.28, that's where um, he speaks that there's going to be a famine uh, in the land and the famine comes to pass. And then you see him again in Acts 21 and verse 10. Acts 21 and verse 10. And he's with the Apostle Paul and he takes the Apostle Paul's belt, wraps up his hands and his legs, kind of ties himself up with it. Says, thus will the Jews do to the man who owns this belt. And it came to pass. There was a binding and there was an arresting uh, in, the, in that next chapter. Uh, when Paul was uh, in, the, in the temple right there. And of course then the Romans got a hold of him, you know. And they bound him too in regards to that. So that is foretelling prophecy. Now, here's the deal. Right now, um, in charismatic, mostly charismatic, not so much classical Pentecost. But in charismatic circles and in a movement known as continuationists. You ever heard of that besides from me? Continuationist. You know who John Piper is? You heard of him? You know who John Piper is. He's a continuationist. Uh, well, I thought he was reformed. <laughs> Me too. He, he is. He is. He is. He's just uh, I'm wrong about this. He's a continuationist. He thinks all these revelation gifts are still are still ongoing. I, I just read a, an article by him um, not too long ago, and he he tells a story about how that he he's still asking God. This is what he says to God. God, I've never spoken in tongues. I would really like to speak in tongues. Would you give me... He's asking. Would you give me this gift? Okay, now this, that's one thing. But now it gets worse. Because now he says, God said to me... God said to me, I have given you the gift of teaching and you need to be satisfied with that. No. God did not say that to him. And 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, verses 8 through 11, says and proves without a shadow of a doubt that God did not say that to him. Okay, but that's, that's where he's chosen to be. That's where his mindset is at right now. For me, I consider that a real shame. I'm very sorry to, to have read that about him. It doesn't make me feel good uh, about where he's at. And uh, I think he's open to be deceived, quite frankly. I think he is deceived. And it opens to, to other things of, of deception. So anyway, this thing's called continuationist, and it seems to be being a charismatic within the reformed realm, which is a contradiction in terms, okay? But anyway, I guess if they use this term continuationist, then it must be, you know, okay, or at least it's okay amongst some. Well, it's not okay with me, um, because I think Scripture has spoken to this pretty, pretty soundly and pretty directly, okay? So then it continues right here. Uh, after prophecy, then there is to another, middle of ten, the discerning of spirits already did that. That gift is still around, I think. But now, these last two, to another, various kinds of tongues, to another, the interpretation of tongues. Now you see that word kinds right there, K-I-N-D-S, that's gina, Ginos, excuse me, in Greek. Ginos, it's the same word that is translated as race or nation or a people group. Now, when Paul uses the word kinds of tongues, that's glossi. That's the plural form. Uh, glossi uh, means known languages. French, German, you know, known languages that we have, Russian, Czechoslovakian, these are known legitimate languages that have meaning. Well, back in Paul's day, on, or, and Peter's, on the, on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, 
There were Medes, Elamites, dwellers among Mesopotamia, Jews, Romans, you know, people from Jews from all over the Roman Empire. And the, all of these empires and these cultures had their own language. And it was a true language that they would use and communicate one to another. See, the word glossus, glosso, glossi, that kind of a thing, are talking about known languages that can be communicated. It is never Babel. And one of the reasons Paul uses the difference between the singular tongue and the plural tongues in 14th chapter of 1 Corinthians is he's discriminating the difference between what is a true language, which is always in the plural, because there's many different kinds of true languages. How many kinds of Babel are there? <laughs> yeah, there's, Babel is just Babel. It has no communicative feature about it. There's only one kind of Babel, and that's Babel. Blah, 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 blah. You know, it's just wow. That's it, man. Tongues right there. Filled with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> See? All right, so when he says here, kinds of tongues, genos, he's amplifying the idea that kinds points towards different nationalities. Once again, it underscores glossi, different true languages. So kinds, languages is what is the idea here, okay? It's not Babel. And to another, the interpretation of tongues. There is no interpretation of a tongue. Wait till we get to 14. You're going to love what Paul does right there because Paul actually tells them, try to interpret a tongue. You'll find that it won't be a manifestation of the Spirit. The, ma the Spirit will not manifest through the interpretation of tongues. He will not because he does not interpret crap. He does not interpret nonsense. He does not interpret confusion. He is not the spirit of confusion, which he's going to end up saying at the end of the, uh, of the 14th chapter in particular. So having said all of that, oh, what should I do, Lord? Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll just overview it. Having said all of that, the question then becomes how... And when and what gifts would pass away? How would they do it? How do we know that they would pass away? When would they pass away? And what gifts are they that pass away? And I'm so glad that Paul has given us the answers to all of those questions in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 8 through 12. I'm going to do this fast. Ready? Here we go. Just hang in there with me and we're done. See, otherwise, I've got to pick this up next week, and I'm, I'm behind as soon as I do that. So let me finish this up. In the 13th chapter, Paul is talking about the primacy of love. Love lasts forever. Love never fails. Isn't that great? Yeah, lo love is permanent, but other things are not. Verse 8, 13th chapter, verse 8, love never fails, but, <laughs> that's great, love never fails, but, uh, if, literally, if prophecy, or if there are gifts of prophecies, because it's plural there, if prophecies, if there are prophecies, they will be done away. That's katergeo. That means to deactivate. And it's, it's katergeo, future passive indicative. It's going to happen in the future, and he's going to say what the indicator is for the future that stops it. Passive voice means that something or someone else outside of that person who has the gift of prophecy uh, deactivates it. In other words, God deactivates it. That's the importance of the pr uh, passive voice. So, if there are prophecies, they will deactivate. If there are tongues, singular or plural, Plural. So he's talking about the genuine gift because you know what? Once the genuine gift is gone and people want to have tongues, they just do it themselves. They just manifest themselves. That's why I say to you, the, these vocal gifts are the easiest ones to mimic and deceive people with. If there are tongues, they will cease. Pow o. Oh. Pow o oh is the Greek word. It means stop like hitting the brakes on your car. Bang. Done. They will just stop. No outside force will act on it. It will just stop, he says. Well, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. Done away is katargeo again, same, same form, all right? Knowledge. Now, knowledge here is not general knowledge. In this context, it demands that it is what? 
Yeah, bang, you get, give her the cigar. Uh, gifts, of, well, she's still coughing, forget it. Okay. Give it to Dallas, I don't know. <laughs> uh, gifts, it's the gift of knowledge. He's not talking about general knowledge. He's, he's in a category of the revelation gifts, prophecy, tongues, knowledge. Now look at verse 9. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. Oh, prophecy, knowledge, it's the gift of knowledge. Is the gift of knowledge, is the gift of prophecy absorbed, complete, and understandable 100%. No, no, no. Because here he says they are partial. They are meros in Greek. So the gift of knowledge, gift of prophecy, and by way of extension, tongues, these are all partial revelation gifts. Verse 10, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. Perfect what? Well, what's the category that we're talking about here? We're talking about revelation gifts, gift of word of knowledge, tongues, prophecy. That's what he's talking about here. So perfect as opposed to partial. When the teleos comes, then the partial, which he just said was prophecy and word of knowledge, then that deactivates, that goes away. Oh, my gosh. Paul just told us what, I mean, well, uh, people say the perfect here, well, it's the second coming of Christ. Well, that's not in the context. So I reject that. That's nowhere in this context. What's wrong with people? Reaching into things and just whatever they want, right? All right. Then they say, well, it's, uh, it's the kingdom of God. Again, not in the context. Not in the context. Well, it's when uh, the believer becomes absolutely perfect and mature and totally. Well, again, not in the context. So what is the perfect? What is the context? It's Perfect revelation compared to partial revelation. Seeing that? Perfect revelation compared. So that means that Paul has just told us when these revelation gifts would pass away, katargeo, or stop tongues all on their own. When perfect revelation comes. Ready? Here we go. Re Psalm 19, verses 7 through 9. Just write it down. I'm not going to turn to it. Psalm 19, verses 7 to, through 9. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The law of the Lord. Uh, the law is Torah. Torah means law or it means teaching. The teaching of the Lord is what is perfect. Uh, Psalm 119, verse 96. Just write it down. Psalm 119, verse 96. Paul says, or Paul, <laughs> that would have been a good trick. David writes there and he says, I have seen an end to all these things. And then he speaks about prophesy, prophesying and prophecy in the context right there. It's the end of of things that are partial, and he bricks, brings up the subject of, of perfect prophecy right there. It's, it's God's teaching word. So, when once God's final revelation, his propositional perfect revelation, perfect, is given, all scripture is inspired, theonustos, God breathed. All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, rebuking, uh, uh, correcting and training in righteousness that the man of God might be perfect or adequate, uh, being fully prepared unto every good work. It's the scriptures. It's the scriptures. Jesus says, uh, you search the scriptures because in them you think you find eternal life, but these are they that speak of me. Um, um, at the end of chapter 14, of 1 Corinthians. Um, Paul is going to say in verse 37, acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the Lord's commandment. In 2 Peter, the third chapter, verse 15, verse 16, Peter talks about how that his writings were equal to the inspiration and authority of the Old Testament writings, the Tanakh and the prophets. So that's clear. So when perfect revelation comes as opposed to partial revelation, the partial will be done away. Now look at verse 11. When I was a child, mature or immature? Immature. immature. I used to speak like a child. Blah, 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 blah. Ask Joanna for her name. Uh, I used to think like a child. That's not happening. Reason like a child. When I became a man, mature or immature? 
Mature, okay. I did away with childish things. So perfection, it's the same word, by the way. It's teleos. It's the idea. So when perfection comes, the childish things are done away with. The immature things are done away with. What's he talking about here? What does he mean by childish things? He means word of wisdom, word of knowledge, tongues, prophecy. He means the revelations that are incomplete, that are immature. So when I get perfect revelation, I do away with this other stuff. That means that the people who are continuationists and those in the Pentecostal and charismatic realm are fostering regular and continuous immaturity in their midst. They won't grow. Their growth is stunted. I don't care how much schooling they have had. I don't care how much experience they have had. I don't care if they hold on to this stuff. That is causing them to slow way down. It's childish. It's childish. I've been practicing this stuff forever. I can still pull it out. It's easy to do. That sounded pretty good. You've got to admit that sounded pretty good. <laughs> sounded pretty good, didn't it? I could have told you that's Swahili or something like that. I mean, some people might have bought it. You're too smart for that. But the point being is that it's just flesh. It's just flesh, and you practice something, you get good at it. So he says, I did away with childish things. Verse 12, for now, he says, now now being when the revelation gifts were active, we see in a mirror dimly. The Greek for dimly there is enigma, enigma. You can hear the English word enigma, which is a dark, mysterious thing. It's the idea of a mirror that's sort of like a funhouse mirror, right? You know, it gives a distorted image. They had no way of machining a perfect reflection, but they did their best. But you, you may be a great-looking guy or a great-looking babe, but looking in the mirror, you, you know, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like I can't be what they think I am because look at me, you know, that kind of thing. So he, he says that, that the gifts are like that. The, the revelation gifts are partial and they they're, leave you in an enigma. Then he says this, but then, verse 10, you put under that word, verse 10. But then, when the perfect comes, what will be? Face to face. There are so many Old Testament passages that use that phrase. I'll just give you one. Exodus 33, 11. Exodus 33, 11 speaks about how that Moses spoke to God face to face like a man does with his friend. So when the perfect comes, guess what you get? You get face to face with the will and mind of God. Here it is. Here it is. What a gift. What a gift. That's it. Why would you want anything else? I don't want anything else. I want this. I want this. Perfect. Now he says... With the gifts, I know in part. I have, I have knowledge, that is the revelation, that is partial. But then, second time he uses that phrase, when the perfect comes, perfect revelation, I will know fully just as I also have been fully known. By God is the idea. <laughs> wow, I shall know what God reveals for me to know. Just like God knows me fully, this word, which is, that just says that this word is inexhaustible in its knowledge, in its reference, in its depth, in its height, in its meaning. It's just inexhaustible. Lifetime after lifetime after lifetime after lifetime. And you still don't get it. I mean, we've got 2,000 years of studied Christianity and books coming out of our noses forever and ever and ever on this text, all kinds of discoveries, and we're still learning. We're still pulling fresh things out of it. It's fantastic. That's why the creed of the Reformed faith is very important. Reformed and always reforming. <sighs> yeah, I heard that. So, Permanent gifts? Yeah. Permanent gifts, gift of faith, healings, miracles, distinguishing of spirits? I think so. Passing gifts, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, prophecy, tongues, interpretation of tongues. We're not done with tongues because we have to do 14. That's coming up. Purpose of the gifts? For the benefit of everybody else. 
When they manifest, they're the manifestation of the Spirit. It's clearly the Spirit. I believe back then in the first century, when somebody had a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge, a tongue, an interpretation of tongue, it was clearly carried along by the Holy Spirit. Nobody went, do you think that... The reason the apostle has to give them so many tests in verse 14 is because guess what? The, Id the idol background and the demonic spirits that were involved with this church. Not to mention what I've talked to you about in regards to their flesh and in regards to all of the baggage and the different religious baggage that they brought with them into the church. I am so glad that God gave us the gifts. I'm so glad he removed the revelation gifts so we can have this. And this is what needs our attention. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you all the praise and the glory and the thanksgiving for all you've taught us today. Thank you, O Lord, for your loving, wonderful kindness that certainly is better than life. And I ask, Lord God, that as we close down the service and we worship you with our giving now, that the giving towards uh, the work of the Lord would be freely within the heart of your people, between you and them, Lord God. I thank you, Lord God, for your provision for these blessed people, O Father, and that you would keep providing for them, keep um, uh, causing their faith to rise up and to believe you, Lord God, for greater and greater provisions as you lay those things on their hearts. But let them believe in accordance with the word, which brings us wisdom on how to believe and what to believe for. So bless them now, Lord God, as they give of their gifts unto you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Go ahead, Frank.